Hello, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host of Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. Today, I'd like to start with an interview from a friend of mine who is a photographer. And um, what I love about her business is she started it um, as a stay-at-home mom, just needing a, a, a little bit extra income, and she has turned it into quite a thriving business. Make sure and check her out. Her name is Lauren Mitchell, and her, her company is called Lauren Jean Photography, and she is based here out in the Southwest. Lauren's influences, they are so many. She says, I love Wendy uh, Whitaker from Blue Lily Photography because of her use of color. Her tones are warm and cool all at the same time. <clears throat> I like Micah Beth Edwards for her clarity in her pictures. Her subjects are sharp while her background in, is beautifully blurred. I really, it really draws your eye to the subject of her picture. I also admire Jasmine Starr for her ability to use words to enhance her pictures. Her blog posts really draw you into thinking behind the camera. She makes you feel involved in her pictures. At the time of this interview, she was using a Nikon D700. She says, I don't really think my creativity transitioned into my adult life at all at first. I think my creativity was put on hold in junior high when I was diagnosed with dyslexia. School has always been difficult for me. And now that I was in junior high, there seemed to be more of a divide between the kids who could do schoolwork and those who could not. I had never even realized I was dyslexic when I was younger. I loved writing and reading, so no one ever picked up on it. As a teenager, I still loved those things, but I felt that I was not allowed to use my creativity because I struggled in school and had bad grades. I think I buried a lot of my creative energy deep inside. I also became a mother and a wife at a very young age. I was in over my head and I actually thought if I took time to develop interest outside of my child, I was somehow failing as a mother. I see a lot of young people and, and not so young mothers fall into that same trap. We are pre-programmed to put away everything about us, put it on hold when we have a baby that if we develop passions outside of our family, we are somehow selfish. That thinking couldn't be further from the truth. When I was finally delivered from a very bad set of circumstances in my first marriage, I finally felt like I had the desire to find out who I was. And I realized that it didn't take away from my children. It added to their lives where mommy was happy. I also love that I am a role model for creativity for my daughters. The transition didn't happen overnight, and there are days when I still feel guilty writing the blog post or editing a picture. But then I step back and remember that it's okay. More than okay. It is necessary. Creativity and Christianity. This answer may sound cheesy, but it's true. As a photographer, I paint with light. My camera is my paintbrush, the world my canvas, and the light my paint. God is the creator of the light. Every time I see the way the light is casting on a subject, I am remi reminded of God's light shining from within us. God is in all creativity because he is the creator. I believe that God especially put the desire to create in women. We are made for creation. It is one of our jobs. When I finally realized that God was not only okay with me being creative, but I was called to be creative. It put a whole new spin on things for me. It made blogging the memories of my family, taking time in the morning to read and reflect on things, and spending time learning more about my craft, more like a higher calling than, th than things that I just enjoyed doing. Currently, I'm working on growing my photography business and trusting that God will leave me, lead me right where I need to be. My dream is that one day he will need me to be in the middle of Africa photographing his hurting children, bringing those images back home to his children in America. I want to take pictures that move people to action, the pictures that speak a thousand words.
That's my dream. This reading is from the New Living Translation, and the following devotion is by Eugene Peterson. It's from Luke 1, 46-55. Mary said, I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing the song of my Savior God. God took one look at me, and look what happened. I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose very name is holy, set apart from all others. His mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before him. He bared his arm and showed his strength, scattered the bluffering braggarts. He knocked tyrants off their high horses, pulled victims out of the mud, The starving poor sat down to a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. He embraced his chosen child, Israel. He remembered and piled on the mercies, piled them high. It's exactly what he promised, beginning with Abraham and right up till now. Take Mary's song of joy and thanks and make it into a personal prayer replacing God with you. Mary was reflecting on a specific intervention of God in her life. Add to your prayer of thanks specific memories of how God has moved into your world and piled mercy upon mercy. How will you reflect God's politics today? His spirit is in you. All of the actions Mary described are happening in your life as well. I'm reading from a book called Crushing, God Turns Pressure into Power by T.D. Jakes. This chapter called Yesterday's Fruit, Tomorrow's Wine. One thing I'm certain of is that God loves me. I've been through too much in my life and seen how the Father has taken care of me to say that he doesn't take his hand and have it on me. I can hardly speak about how I've seen God move in my life without being overwhelmed. I realize that some people don't feel that way about God. They look at their lives and can only see the negativity that forces them to ask, If God loves me, why does life keep hurting me? Why do I keep losing everything that's valuable? Really? Is what you lost that valuable? In this season, in this age, in this stage of your life, the fruit you've held on to has been culled, and you're desperately trying to stop the bleeding. On the outside, your blessings have been taken from you. But the exterior pains you feel are accompanied by the inward agony for what you cannot reclaim. But the Master has not placed value where we have. Whereas we long for what has been taken, the master is overjoyed with what remains. Could it be that the Lord hides next season's harvest in what we have left? Your miracle is never in what you lost. It's in what you have left. If you're down to a handful of meal, that's all you need. If you're down to two fish and five loaves of bread, that's all you need. Like the widow in the Old Testament, 2 Kings, you can be down to one last jar of oil, but the Lord has created more capacity for you to pour out, improve upon, and increase what you have left. The Lord, then, would have you begin looking at what remains and cease grieving over what you've lost. After all, if you needed what the Master took from you, Do you really believe the Lord would have sought to take it? For what God is taking, for where God is taking you, you don't need the weight 
and refuse of yesterday's bread. The master has an expected end for your life, and the trip doesn't require the extra baggage of last season's blessings. If the Lord in all his wisdom took from you what would weigh you down during the last leg of your journey, why would you seek ways to regain it? In pruning you, the Lord is assisting you in circumspectly and precisely tailoring your life down to carry only what you need to get you where he wants you to go. Because he knows that the blessing of last season's harvest can become a trap and graveyard for your future. Are you willing to leave behind yesterday's fruit so you can embrace the wine of tomorrow's new season? I'm writing to those of you who find yourselves awestruck by the damage left behind by a master who dares to cut you. Though it appears that everything you built has been taken from you, the Lord has strategically left a remnant that will rise and give rise to more fruit next season. It's the remnant that is most valuable to the wine dresser, for there is life in what remains. Thanks so much for stopping by. Happy New Year. I hope you're looking forward into the year with expectation. You can find me on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren, N-O-R-G-R-E-N, or under at U-B-U for life, all words spelled out. <laughs>